Vítam vás pri počúvaní ďalšieho vydania v ženskom rode. Podcast v ženskom rode môžete pravidelne odoberať cez Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts alebo Spotify. Sledovať, komentovať a najmä zdieľať ho ďalším poslucháčom môžete aj na sociálnych sieťach Facebook a Twitter. Teším sa, že ste súčasťou môjho dobrodružstva dávať šancu múdrym ženským myšlienkam, inšpiratívnym príbehom a hlbokým dušiam. V dnešnom podcaste Ivonka Kálman spomína aj na to, že I think it's up to every woman to realize that the world is hers, it's just what she wants to do with it. And if she really wants to fulfill her dream, then she should go for it. Ivonka Kálman je poslednou žijúcou cérou svetoznámeho hudobného skladateľa Imre alebo Emericha Kálmana, autora operiet ako Čardášová princezná či Grovka Marica, ktoré patria aj do nášho slovenského hudobného dedičstva. Imre Kálman bol žid a s manželkou a tromi deťmi stihol pred Hitlerom utiecť do Spojených štátov a tam začať v New Yorku nový život. S Ivonkou som sa stretla v Bratislave po prvý raz, aby sme sa rozprávali o jej slávnom otcovi, mame, ale najmä o nej samej. V ženskom rode dnes nie len o nádej a láske, ale aj o sláve, bohatstve, kultivovanosti, dôležitosti dobrých spôsobov a úprimného priateľstva. What I would want you to talk about today is yourself. I read about the history of your family, about uh, the quite um, adventurous, let's say, uh, escape from Europe to America. But what I really liked uh, was the, the little story you gave about the cook you had in your family. Uh, she was actually a very well-known cook Uh, with a, with a, a fantastic reputation and uh, you said that she cooked only for you and your family and she actually was for from Vihne yes she was which is uh, near Jar nad Hronom I've been there and you've been there with her many 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 years ago what was your favorite food she cooked for you oh my god Can you remember? Everything. She was amazing. I was just telling someone the other day that when she prepared for my father's birthday, he loved something called cold rice. It was a it was a cake made out of rice, but the beauty of this thing was that it had candied fruit mm-hmm. of every kind. Rizovi nakib, maybe? <laughs> I think that's what it was. And she would start in the in the early summer when the fruits came out cherries strawberries melons tangerines in the winter everything she would candy them herself mm-hmm. and then she would make this rice with whipping cream and almonds and she would have the rice inside and then decorate the whole top of the cake with it it was beautiful my father really really loved it and then she made something very simple that was my favorite dish and my father's favorite dish and it's in hungarian it's called kapusta kotska and it is just plain white cabbage mm-hmm. that you um chop up very small and you put salt in it for a half a day mm-hmm. a few hours and then you have to have somebody very strong squeeze out all the salt so it's reduced to a very almost a paste mm mm-hmm. And then you take that and you fry it. Wow. In, in, well, they used to do it in pork fat or, mm-hmm. you know, duck fat or chicken fat or butter or some, something, you know, that you're not supposed to have. And then, not very, and then she would pepper it quite uh-huh. a bit. And then it would get golden and it would separate, you know, she would separate yeah. it. And then she would roll out her own tester and she would um, then cut it up in slices and in squares that was mm-hmm. the kotska and she would boil it like at any pasta and then dry it and then combine it with the cabbage 
Wow. And then it would be very spicy from the pepper. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, at the end, I'm sure she threw in some more butter just in case. And then it was the most delicious dish in the world. But there are two ways to serve it. So we would have it with pepper mm-hmm. as a main dish and then with sugar as dessert. <laughs> the same. So that the oh, same wow. thing. And my father wasn't supposed to have it because he suffered from heart disease. And you know how bad that is. But God, for his birthday, he had it, and he loved it. (laughs) And some of my friends know about it, and so they always surprise me with it. Kapusta ve fliatki. Okay. (laughs) That's what it is. (laughs) Fantastic. Um, Did she live with you? Well, it was a very sad thing. I, You know, later in my life, I went to a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst for several years, and I talked about her. It was one of the sad things of my life was that she always had a packed suitcase. She was always the person that wanted to leave. You know, and as a child, it was heartbreaking for me because I always felt no matter what I did, she would leave me. It was very sad. And she did it, leave us in California. Uh, We came there with my father in 1940, and she was the only person out of all the staff we had that was able to travel because... She was not Austrian, she was Hungarian. Mm -hmm. So she came with us to Paris before 1940, where my father had a short stay. And then, um, you know, you wanted to talk to me about me, but I can't talk about me without telling you why I am how I am and who I am. And everything colors your life. And uh, Hitler sent a very important... Um, person to see my father in Paris, where we had moved. And um, he said, the Führer would like you to come back, and he will make you an honorary Aryan. He loves your music, and he wants to... So your father was a Jew? Yes, yes. And uh, so my father said, really, and who will guarantee my life? And he said, I will. And then my father didn't say it, but he thought... And who will guarantee your life? And my father was very charming and said, thank you very much. I'll consider the offer. But right after he left, he called Genoa and made reservations for the whole family. And the next day we were in Genoa going to the United States. And it was March 1940. And we were very lucky that we were able to come to the United States. On the very last boat or well, one of the last close, boats? Very close to the end. Civilian boats yes. going, uh, leaving Europe. For we were very lucky. Years. So she was with us, and but she wasn't happy in the States, and so she was always with a packed suitcase ready to leave us. And she actually did leave us in California and went to work in a Hungarian hotel outside of New York City. And my father was unhappy in, in L.A. It wasn't the L.A. that it is today, and I don't mm. think he would have liked the L.A. today either. You know, he was used to Vienna and and Budapest and, you know, the yeah. kind of life that he loved. And uh, it was so foreign to him, in especially California. So we drove, my mother drove us the whole way from Los Angeles to New York. By car? By car. Fantastic. Yes. And I remember seeing all the beautiful national parks that, as a child. How old were you then? I was probably three, three and a half. Mm-hmm. And we moved to New York City, and uh, we went out to the weekend, for the weekend, to the Hungarian hotel. And she had taken over the whole animal world. She would go in, and she would call the ducks, and they would all come to her. And she would call the chickens, and they would come, and the kittens would come, and the cats would come, and the dogs. Well, I've always loved animals. And so I was so thrilled. And after the weekend, my father said, don't you want to come back? And she said, yes, I do. So she came back to live with us in New York, but always had the packed suitcase. And then she, when we moved back to Europe, she moved with us. So let's um, let's go back to the, the point, as you said. Uh, of course, I wanted to talk about you and focus on you. But of course, you know, we are... We all are members of our families, so I understand that you cannot really separate yourself. But what what I wanted to say is that um, my interest is 
and how you actually, although you were very young, as you said, you have you were three and a half. That's really very very young age to actually understand what's going on. But you probably felt somehow from what was going on in your family that intuition of your father must have been very strong that he was able to actually save all your family yes but it was a very sad sad mm-hmm. life for him he came to the states and didn't speak a word of english and his music had been very popular there very early and now you know people still knew th- him a little bit but not much mm-hmm. and he was a fish out of water you know it's very hard and uh, but he made the best of it he did compose he did have successes he did have a show on broadway and we my mother was a very beautiful woman and she entertained oh yes she was i've seen the pictures oh. she entertained a lot and uh, we lived in beautiful apartment in on park avenue later And um so they had a you know a very very lovely life there except that you know he had the internal problem about not being able to communicate with his family not really knowing what happened and then at the end of the war he finally found out that uh, two of his sisters had been ended in the concentration camp and his whole family was in the concentration camp and uh, that they tried to at the end they, they tried to kill them at the end they didn't succeed but two did succeed they did kill them my father had a heart attack and he never recuperated and uh, from the sadness from the sadness yes the loss he was very heavy he wrote very light music but he was a heavy, very heavy personality You had a brother, an older brother and an older sister. Yes. How was life in America for you? I guess it was like everybody else. New York is not the most wonderful place to raise children if you're right in the center of town. Um It was a difficult difficult childhood. Um I adored my father and my mother was not there very much. What was she doing? She was doing the social life. She was very, very social. So it was uh, sad, you know. It wasn't. It wasn't like um. Like you went to the movies and you saw happy families together. It was like this one went in one direction, the other one went in the other direction. And then there was, you know, then there was me trying to grow up. Who was taking care of you? I had a nurse, a British nurse, very nice lady. And uh, she taught me the King's English or the Queen's English. You lived a life, a wealth life, a wealthy life. I mean, your your father at a time when he was composing uh, music in 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 uh, Vienna, it was very popular. Um, you said in one of the interviews that he actually probably was a millionaire. So you 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 had. Um, quite a life with having a nurse very nice apartment in central park uh, your parents quite famous uh, visiting people like Greta Garbo and Marlene Dietrich and Clark Gable so society around you was really the high society um however what i am aiming for is how that life is able to shape and cultivate you as a kid as a child well it really didn't not at all i was always the exception and i'm still the exception i have two well i have three older cars um i i love um i'm actually very simple and i got that from my father i'm very content and i don't need a huge amount of comfort i need certain things that i need but i'm not over you know i'm not crazy over the top and you know i always have this part of me that says my one of my friends just bought a 
fantastic Lexus. Pardon me, not Lexus. It's a uh, Tesla. And he paid $150,000 for it. And it, he can fall asleep and the car knows what to do while he's <laughs> yep. getting from point A to point B. <laughs> doesn't happen very often, but it can. And then I think, geez, that would be so much fun. I'd love to have it. But then that voice tells me, what are you going to do with it? I live in Mexico now. Who's going to fix it? I do have a car in California when I go there so that I can get off the plane and drive myself wherever I need to go. But it would be impractical to have it sit there until I get there. So I can talk myself out of things very so no, so easily. So material life isn't really something very important for you? No. What about the good manners, culture, something, you know... Um, good manners in a, in a sense of of old times when uh, when i talk to my friends about you know raising children and how important it is to teach them good manners uh, so that you know boys later on behave like gentlemen and uh, and girls n- know how to accept that as young ladies is that something which was important for you did you see it uh in your life in your during your childhood uh and is it something important for you and important in modern life i think um a sensitivity to the world around you is terribly important and i think boundaries are very important and i think uh raising children with good behavior is terribly important because it's something that you always can fall back on later in life in your intimate life as well as in your larger larger sphere yes i think it's very important and i also think um something that my father taught me is which goes back to that but is even deeper my father was not religious he was jewish but he didn't practice But what he said was, Ivan, if you, he called me Ivanka. Mm-hmm. And he said, if you want to be a good person and a happy person, just there is something called the golden rule. And if you treat people in life the way you want them to treat you, you will always go well. And I think that that is something that you need to teach children. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes we are luckier than the person that's sitting at us with us at the same table or the table next door or serving the meal if we are polite and considerate to them it's kind of like makes you feel better inside yourself i think i believe that you 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 met during your your life uh, a lot of famous people did you as a kid did you actually um understand who is actually meeting your family who is coming to visit yes but you know the lovely thing about it is and i've i've known so many very very important people in in the course of my life and the the bigger they are and the and the more important they are the the more down to earth they are in their private life and um so no matter how they have their outside persona their inside persona is pretty down to earth and pretty fun usually or sensitive and if not then they spend a lot of time talking to a psychiatrist why aren't they happy you know mhm these are and then finally they find out that it's inside of them to make themselves happy you know not many people um i mean i i consider myself to be really an ordinary young woman. I I don't think that I am in any way exceptional in a sense that I would be meeting, you know, very important people or rich people or, you know, some sort of uh, celebrities. Uh, and every time I meet someone from the world I think or I consider to be the big world, uh and now i i have you in my studio and i feel humbled 
in a way that I just try to stress how, how important it is to interconnect or somehow make ordinary people to understand that exceptional people, rich people, celebrity people, or you know, people who live in the world we read about in the newspapers and we see them on, you know, on TV and in big opera houses or uh, on you know in theaters in in movies that that they are also ordinary people with their ordinary lives. Yes, there is a that is a leveler that um, you know you can strive for something very great. But when you come right down to it, we're all we're all just people. How um, do you remember your life in New York? How was it? Well, I was a very little girl, and I remember going to school, and I remember my father and mother having parties that were wonderful, and having all those famous people that you mentioned, and and then some more. And uh, I remember my father being in the kitchen with the cook, with Pucci, mm-hmm. from Vichne, and uh, my mother coming out to get him. Darling, with a party, your guests, you have to come out, you have to come out. And he'd go out for a few minutes, and then he'd go right back in the kitchen. And there was a, always a kitchen table with four seats, and he would fill them with his close friends. And they would see everything that was coming out of the kitchen, and they loved it. That's actually one of, oh, it was, because my, my, my grandmother... No, uh, no longer lives, but that was actually the very same thing happening in the house of my of my grandmother. That we would all be in the living room, you know, chatting, and in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, a dozen of minutes, suddenly we would just understand that every single person moved to the kitchen, and finally we were sitting behind the kitchen table and talking uh, to each other and having really good fun because we somehow, you know just moved ourselves to the to the heart of the house and that was the kitchen that's right you as children you could attend the parties or i, I didn't i was too young but my brother and sister did they were older so they, they were invited uh and what happened then did you actually you know lived all or you all the life in 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 america or? no 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 um my father and mother Well, my mother especially wanted to move back to Paris because she was Russian and she still had friends in Paris and she loved Paris. And my father didn't really want to move there. He didn't, he'd had a stroke and he didn't speak good French anyway. He had a nurse 24 hours a day, but she con- she convinced him and got a wonderful apartment for us in uh, Paris. And I went to school there. And uh, When did you move? We moved in, oh God. After war, I think. Uh, yeah, 51, I think. 51, mm-hmm. and my father died in 53. And then um, I was all alone because my mother didn't really want to be burdened with children. She wanted to be a single woman again. And so I had a terrible time with the loss. And uh, for five years, every night I dreamt that he hadn't died. And for five years, I would then think he was alive and I'd wake up and I knew he was had died. So it was really very difficult. And, How old uh, were you then? By then, I was 16 to 21, 22. And so I had a very difficult uh, life, that part of... So you had a very strong bond to your father. Yes, he was a wonderful man. Wonderful man. Outside of the wonderful music he wrote, he was a great human being and a great father. You know, so um, I was sort of lost as a young woman and had a lot of adventures and misadventures. And uh, then... Did you study? I did. I was in school... For one horrible year in North Carolina where I just didn't fit in at all. I had no idea. It was before. It was still during segregation, and I had no idea that people lived like that. You know, it was So you came back from, from, from Europe 
to do your studies in America? Yes. Why? Why so? I mean, in, in well, Paris, because, you, you know, you had... Well, because we, my mother gave up the apartment in Paris. I wouldn't have had no place to go. Okay. And I always felt like an American, you know. I I spent my formative years there. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to go back, but the North Carolina experience was horrible for me. And uh, so I had met a man when I was 15, and I had a crush on him all that time. He was in one of my father's shows. Mm. And very handsome, of course. And uh, and this was before I was um, before I was twenty one, when I was eighteen, and uh, we got married. You got married when we you got, were eighteen. We got married when I was eighteen, and I got divorced when I was eighteen. <laughs> it was not the greatest relationship. Was, what an adventure! <laughs> it was. It was. And then I went back to the United States again, and I instead of going back to North Carolina, which I couldn't stand, I went to Boston. Mm-hmm. I went to school there and stayed seven years. I loved it. What did you study? I stu- I went to a theatrical college mm-hmm. called Emerson. It's quite famous. I didn't <laughs> learn theater, but I learned um, I learned everything to do with the voice. I was fascinated with speech. I mm-hmm. still am. I love to find, I love to hear and try to find out where people are from and what part of the world and what part of the United States. I loved it. So I did a lot of that. And um, and I loved my time in Boston. And then um, I had a girlfriend and, of course, I had a boyfriend that I was very crazy about. And uh, I came to Europe and we were going to, my friend and I were the girl we're going to get an apartment in Zurich. Mm-hmm. And we spent a little bit of the summer outside of Rome. I had never, I had been to Rome once for a day or something like that. And then this gentleman that she was going out with said, look, I'm going to Rome for overnight. Why don't you three come with me just for one night, one day, see if you like it. I fell in love with it. I fell so in love with it that we gave up Zurich and I got an apartment immediately. And I stayed seven years and I adored it. It's not difficult to fall in love with it. Really, all. especially in those days. It was sort of Dolce Vita time. Yeah. It was gorgeous and it was so much fun. And I did all kinds of different things there. I wrote songs, not the music, but the words for for movies. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I had a lovely club, which specialized in at that time in folk music. It was great. In folk, like uh, f- folk, which folk music? American. American. American folk music. And um, I j- just everything I did, I loved. Did you work for a living? Not in Rome. I, but I did make a living with my music the, for the movies and the and the club. And then um, I had very close friends, and I've always been very involved with the men I'm involved with, and I had a wonderful relationship with the man, and it was about to end, and my close friends, he was a very famous Hollywood composer, and he said, come back, both of them said, come back, come live in California, and put your roots down, you're going to love it, and don't stay in Rome anymore. I'd been there seven years, and... I felt a, this inner loneliness, you know, I never really got mm-hmm. over it. And it was very important for me because I did start therapy, real serious therapy. And I was able to find out my problems in my life, the loneliness that I'd carried with me so long. I was very many years in therapy. And was the the loneliness, was it somehow connected to the move you had to America or was it the loneliness because of the loss of your father? Well, the loss of my father was very, very sad, but it was not a problem for me because he gave me so much love and that was internalized. I had no problem with it, but my mother was never around. You know, that really was very hard and that was the problem. I thought so, but I wanted to ask about about it and I wanted you to tell me um, because it's always about 
mothers. Yeah. And then, you know, it's so interesting because the latter part of her life, I was able to get very close to her or as close as anyone could. It's very hard to get close to somebody that's really very narcissistic. But I found the solution. And? She didn't want to be a mother. She did not even like the word mother. Why so? Mother. Because it interfered with her vision of herself. Mm -hmm. And um, she was what so... What was it? What, what, how? She, she was so glamorous and she mm -hmm. was... She loved the youthfulness of herself. She loved the fact that she could come in a place and, you know, everybody would... Steal the attention. And, uh, and really amazing. <gasps> and uh, she was always on TV shows and always in the press, especially in Vienna, in Munich, in Berlin. And, you know, she was she was a personality. Can you tell us about the, how she met your father? Because that's a very nice story. Oh, Okay. <laughs> But um, anyway, so the problem was, let me finish this. Mm -hmm. When the problem with my mother was that she didn't really have time to be a mother and didn't want to be bothered. But she loved her girlfriends. She was a really good friend to her friends. So I figured out, instead of wanting the motherly love, let me see if I can make her my friend. And you know what? It worked. And I would advise anybody that has that kind of a problem with somebody that doesn't, that cannot give in a certain way, and it's important for them to reach that person, to try to figure out a different way to connect. And I connected. She was my big friend, and I was her little friend. And you know, we developed an amazing rapport. And of course, she got older and... She, you know she perhaps matured as well she matured and she couldn't help it because she had a pretty awful childhood too you know and so that leads me to my father and my mother in vienna uh, my father would go to cafe sacher in the sacher hotel in the center of town right by the opera house and he, all the composers and everyone would be there they would It was an every every afternoon event. And this very pretty young woman came in with her mother. And then she would sit at a table the whole time. She'd be staring at my father. And he would smile back, you know, and he'd, he would um, go back to his conversation. And then she'd smile some more. And then um, one day she came in without her mother. And my father was just leaving and she quickly zoomed out to the to the coat um, closet or vestiaire and uh, they put, uh, they gave him his coat first and then they had the coat for her. And my father said, may I help you? And she said, yes, I want a part in your next show. <laughs> He was all, of the coat. <laughs> exactly. And so he said, well, come tomorrow morning, come tomorrow morning to the uh, rehearsal and I'll see what I can do for you. So he talked to the director. The show was The Duchess of Chicago. It was, I think, in 1928 or so. And uh, my father wanted her to get a good part, but they he said, we'll give her part in the third act and she'll be fine. So that's how the relationship started. He would come every day and he would have two little sandwiches for himself and he would give her one. And then he started dating her and then he stopped dating her because he realized how much younger she was than he and he didn't want. How much? Well, it always got, the difference got wider, but she, around 30 years for sure. And so he knew that that was not a good idea. But... um. He fell in love with her and um, and married her and adored her, adored her. It was one of those things he couldn't live with her and he couldn't live without her. So they spent a lifetime together. She did leave him for another man. And during the whole time that she was in Reno trying to get a divorce, he would write her every single day. And then when she arrived and she was divorced, the man that she 
wanted to marry wasn't at the train station, and my father was. So she came back. And so we were moving apartments, and she said, well, I'll help you all. And so she came to the apartment. It was late at night. I said, Mommy, why don't you stay over? And she said to my father, Imre, would you like me to do that? And he said, sure, do that. So she stayed, and a few days later, they got remarried. And when he took her to the place to get remarried, they were in the elevator, and he said, you better be sure, because I'm not marrying you a third time. So he married her a second time. What a story. What did you do when you came to California from Rome? That's, um, I worked in an art gallery. And uh, for fun, I uh, I had a friend that I knew from all the big parties and we'd gone together to the Golden Globes Award and different things. And um, I've always loved horses and I rode horses, started in Baden-Baden. And I had found a wonderful place outside of LA where you could ride. And so she was in front of the Beverly Hills post office and she had an old, gorgeous Mercedes um, 190, I think, mm -hmm. SL, something like that. And I had my little Porsche, which I still have, by the way. My old Porsche, in this, my 60s Porsche. And so um, I was driving by and I saw her and she said, oh, my car just didn't start. I don't know what direction you're going in, but do you want to give me a ride? I said, sure, of course, get in. So she got in and just the time from driving from the post office to her house, I told her about my horse back riding and she said, oh, I love horses too so much. Can't we go together? Well, we did. And from there started out the most wonderful friendship. She, like I had, was European and spoke a lot of languages and was a wonderful and is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friend. And um, she and I rode all through California, everywhere. We started out borrowing people's trailers and then going different places and sleeping. She would sleep in the trailer. She'd clean it all and then she'd make her bed in the trailer. And then I had a little tent. And Fantastic. Then, and then <laughs> later on, we bought a, I, I bought a motor home and she joined me when we went horseback riding. And then later on, she bought a vehicle and we always went with our horses. And then she got married and I got remarried. And then we'd have four horses with us. And we went to, diff there's no part of California that I haven't been on horseback. It's a wonderful experience. Of course, we had our own horses. And um, she still rides. I've given it up. But it's the most important thing to her is her daily ride in the mountains. It's so beautiful. It's and like Her Majesty the Queen. She does it as well. Does she still? Yes, she does. At least I saw the pictures, I think, from this year, too. You must love animals. I do, very much. Why so? Oh, because they are so honest and... and uh, sweet and have a great nature and uh, because they need our help. I know that you are saving dogs in Mexico. And cats. And cats. Why is it so important for you? I mean, you know, if some people may say, may, may think that it's, you know, just a, a rich woman living in Mexico and uh, not knowing what to do. So she, there she goes and uh, does some sort of a charity with dogs. Tell me more about that. Because I feel that whether, well, I love, I, I have this about older people as well, but, you know, there are a lot of people taking care of older people, but, you know, the, or babies or little kids, you know, they're helpless unless we help them. And it's very important because they give you boundless amounts of love and relatively they need so little in return. And I think it's up to people to to give them a break, to give them help because of what they give us in return. So it's very easy for me to to spend my time trying to help and and have 
you know, health clinics that do free spaying and neutering, very, very important. And then trying to find homes for animals that, I mean, unfortunately in Latin countries and many other countries, animals have been very mistreated and it's just giving them a second chance or a third chance, whatever it may be, and giving them a better life, a good life. It's terrible what people can do to animals. I know. But it's so wonderful how quickly they can recover and give you all their love. Why do you come back to Slovakia and to this part of the world? Well, I've only been coming to Slovakia for a short period of time. I was here once before um, the European Union and before the separation of Czech and Slovakia. And um, it was a really very... Um, beautiful place with a lot of memories, but it was a sad place. And now it's so exciting for me to be here because I feel that it has so much hope and so much promise and so much to offer. And just think it's beautiful. I think that um, Bratislava is a wonderful place. The way it's situated on the Danube and how much nature there is still in a big city and And I love the contrast here, and I'm so happy that people now are trying to rehab the some of the very beautiful buildings from from before the, the century and the early part of the century, and the new wonderful buildings that are being built. And I feel that there is a very good uh, vibration here. I think that it's going to blossom here. I really feel it. And it's such a it's so well situated, and the way the Danube runs through the city, it couldn't be prettier. And um, there are some wonderful little gems here, um, such the as the, well, the hotel that I stay at, I just yeah, adore well. it, and it's more like a club. And you were in Pezinog yesterday, and that is so beautiful. And, uh, <laughs> that is so beautiful. You and, know that our. Madam President is from Pezinok. I was told it's a beautiful place and the castle is fantastic. Mm. And the wines that are being uh, grown now are so good. The Sauvignon Blancs are just fantastic. And um, no, I think it's wonderful. And I think um, for tourism, you get so much for your money. It's, you know, it's fantastic, really. What do you feel? Do you have any feelings of something when you come to Vienna? It's a very interesting question. Um, a lot of unhappy memories. And... Uh, I, if you ask me about what do I feel when I come to Hungary, I love it. I love it. I've always loved it. When I come to Vienna, I admire the beauty, but I sure know I don't belong there. You know, I'm a tourist. I stay in the best hotel. I have the best service. But when my business is over in Vienna, I leave and come to Bratislava. What do you think your father would, uh, would he like what he would see around? I know that he would adore to see the beauty of Budapest right now. They, I don't know if you've been there lately, but it's like every week there's something, a, a building that has been completely rehabbed and has come back to its normal old beauty. And There's one more wonderful landmark after another. And I also, when I stay there, I stay at a hotel that overlooks the Danube. So I'm, I'm in love with the Danube. But um, my father would love that. Um, I, he did come back to Austria and to Vienna after, after the war. And um, I know he wouldn't live there anymore. was too much probably to to think about 
and the family and yes um my mother did go to vienna quite a bit and she was so popular there there you know there is a every night there is a tv show and she was all the prominent people are on it and she was on it at least once a week and uh she was uh, very very uh, very happy there so i would go visit when she was there quite a bit but um i i don't travel for choice i travel for necessity because i'm very very happy in my home in mexico so what is it a necessity well because i do represent my father's works and i i have been very active in the renaissance of his works in many different places and uh, so of course i want to see what what they're performing and how they're performing it and uh, that's that's the necessity in this podcast i always talk to women and uh, my question leads to you and uh, and women in the world i assume that that during you know all your travels and uh, meeting interesting people you, you must have met a lot of interesting uh, you know captivating women are there any you know outstanding from the crowd yes there are there are some women that i think are fantastic as Such hu- as? as human beings and also as representing arts and different things of very what a woman that i admire completely you mentioned opera before would be anna netrebko i'm very much a fan of her as a singer the way she's developed her voice from being a young light singer to being one of the greatest singers that you can cast almost in anything because she has such a powerful beautiful quality of voice and she's able to use it any way she wants to she's an excellent actress and she's a woman of the world she's a fantastic woman and yet she's also a mother a wife a daughter a very good friend she's very loyal and she has really made an incredible career that i'm so proud that i'm her friend she's somebody i really admire it's it's a woman's world now i think that women are finally having a chance to to shine and it's what they want to do with it they just can get very much beyond the fact that they're women you know like mrs merkel in germany she's been an amazing leader um there are many fantastic women and in the united states we have a lot of fabulous women too and uh i think it's up to every woman to realize that the world is hers it's just what she wants to do with it and if she really wants to fulfill her dream then she should go for it and another thing that i learned in my therapy for many many years was if you really really want something then you can psychologically make yourself already have that and then it's half the fight is already won because you're there and it's we all have the capacity to be the people that we want to be it's just up to us i was very lucky to meet and work for our madam president our first president ever uh the female president we, we ever had and uh that's one of the things which i um myself learned or you know perceived from everything from the beginning of 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 how she started her campaign and uh, how she ended in the presidential palace is that actually you just need to be true to yourself 
and um, and believe in what you are bringing and just try to be honest with it and you know honestly present it to people and uh, that honesty then that that truthfulness is actually what matters the most it's not the winning it's it's being who you are and really believing in yourself in that uh what the, the reason why i'm asking about these women is that i could see when you were talking about your friend that some sometimes it is so important to actually acknowledge the that we need to have female friends and and bonds it's like what you when you were saying about your mom that it's very important to actually find a way to find the bond with a woman you need to have in your life because it's so important for the energy absolutely absolutely yes as you know i I've, i've been very interested in um what's happened in in slovakia i don't know that much about the inner politics but i have um had the privilege to see pictures of this beautiful young woman and hear about how you know she came to power how she won the hearts of so many people and it's just such a great story it is and i hope it will last long <laughs> yes one can only wish her well and hopefully she'll be able to have a new start here and not have to take the whole baggage with her that's probably one of the hardest things in p- politics is to get a new broom <laughs> and to sweep all the old out and to get the new in what is happiness happiness can be sharing a beautiful sunset with a friend happiness can be satisfaction in something that you've done happiness can be someone coming in a room that you haven't seen that you are surprised in love happiness can really be the feeling that you've done your best and happiness and unhappiness is all part of life we can't always be happy and we shouldn't always be unhappy but to be able to measure and not be too hard on ourselves and allow us to or allow ourselves to be happy that's so important what do you believe in I believe very much in the golden rule that my father taught me. I believe very much in the terrible terrible effects of some of the policies that are going on right now in in the world. I believe and I hope it's not too naive, but I hope that and I believe that good will conquer bad what are you most thankful for i guess i'm very thankful that i've had the opportunities that i have and i'm very grateful that i am who i am ďakujem že ste počúvali môj podcast v ženskom rode ak vás tento rozhovor zaujal vypočujte si aj tie ostatné v ženskom rode môžete sledovať a zdieľať aj na facebooku Napíšte mi svoje názory, nápady a hodnotenie. Už o týždeň v stredu sa na vás teším s novým dielom.